Part 4. The True Interpretation. Six Messianic Prophecies. The study of Bible prophecy will always be a strong attraction for the believer. There is a powerful element of curiosity present in our human nature. Jesus addressed this gift when he commanded us to search the scriptures. Unfortunately, some ministers will shun prophetic study and seek to defend their indifferent positions in a variety of ways. Some excuses are very clever. Nevertheless, we are commanded to declare all the counsel of God. I acknowledge that eschatology has been made increasingly difficult by the flood of various interpretations. That is why it is essential that we grasp the keys of knowledge pertaining to the prophetic and build carefully and accurately with them. I hope this unfolding interpretation of the 70 weeks will arm even the elementary prophetic minister or student with the most important key available, the truth. Keep in mind that the futuristic interpretation was never considered for over 15 centuries. It did not penetrate into Protestant theology for another three. A cloud of witnesses refused to entertain such twisting of the scriptures, especially since the source was no secret. The change in interpretation would have been all right if it were a revelation from God for the end of the age, but it wasn't. It was a deceptive teaching from Ribera. To finish the transgression, Isaiah 53, 5 states, He was wounded for our transgressions. In Daniel 9, 11, we read that all Israel have transgressed thy law. But the unmatched height of this transgression occurred at Calvary when Israel crucified her Messiah. Adam Clark comments that this was to finish Lachal, to restrain the transgression, which was affected by the preaching of the gospel and pouring of the Holy Ghost upon men. To make an end of sins, Matthew one twenty one states, He shall save his people from their sins. In Hebrews 9.26 we read, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Adam Clark expounded beautifully on these very vital aspects of the prophecy, and I again quote him, To make an end of sins, rather Ulahatham Chatoath, to make an end of sin offering, which our Lord did when he offered his spotless soul and body on the cross once and for all. On Calvary, Christ was numbered with the transgressors, but he was there for the vast transgressions of his people. It was there that he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Who can doubt that his perfect atonement made an end of the need for future sin offerings? To make reconciliation for iniquity. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, the Apostle Paul proclaims, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Paul states again in Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Clark teaches that he made reconciliation, ulachapur, to make atonement for expiation, for iniquity, which he did by the once offering up of himself. It is almost unbelievable to think that some would put these events into the future, yet to be fulfilled by the Antichrist. Impossible, you say? No, unfortunately it's reality. Some futurist writers have tried to tell us this. By placing this great event in the future, they nullify the proclamation of Christ's reconciliation. Christ came not only to atone, but likewise to reconcile. This he fulfilled. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Second Corinthians 5.21 states, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The great prince of preacher Spurgeon declared, One of the main designs of Christ coming to earth was to bring in everlasting righteousness. The futurist school casts all these blessings into a future millennium, but Jesus has become to the Christian his righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul made it clear that the kingdom of God was righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, Romans 14.17. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah foretold of this righteousness, which would be forever, 
Isaiah 51, 8. And Jeremiah speaks of the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. To seal up the vision and prophecy, Isaiah 29, 10 through 11, verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, and the seers hath he covered. Verse 11, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. When Isaiah used the word sealed here, he used it in the same context as did the prophet Daniel when writing about the king's seal on the lion's den, Daniel 6.17. It meant to close up tightly. Because of Israel's refusal to listen and to heed the words of the prophets, finally rejecting the Lord himself, their judgment would be a terrible blindness that would tightly seal up the scriptures to their understanding. Paul elaborates on this theme in 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 15, verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Again, because of Israel's cry, his blood be on us and our children, Part of their judgment was a blindness to what the prophets wrote concerning their Messiah. To anoint the most holy, the scriptural evidence which points to Christ on this issue is unshakable. Christ alone fulfilled this prophecy. Look at what the scriptures say. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke one thirty five. Luke again records, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 4.18 In Acts 10.38, it is proclaimed, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Finally, we gain from Adam Clark's insight. And to anoint the most holy, Kodesh Kodashim, the holy of holies, Meshach, to anoint, from which come Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. I stand defiant of any teacher or expositor who applies these holy prophecies to any other than Jesus himself. Why were the 70 weeks determined? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy.